says Mike. My name is Mike, and I had aspirations. I had ambitions. Moreover, I had a secret savings account designed for a cross-world trip that my wife and I planned to go on in a couple of years. In mid-September, during the annual staff meeting at a modest college, I noticed my wife Tracy, blushing and beaming intensely, as she engaged in conversation with several colleagues. It was at that moment, standing about 15 feet away from her, that I caught her reaction. Tracy had a conversation with Rafe Sears, the newly appointed associate professor of English literature, and Janet Barnes, a colleague from the administration. Considering that we were at a Christian college, I strongly doubted that any of them would share a dirty joke. Therefore, the only plausible explanation for Tracy's constant blush was her increased intimate desire. I got an unexpected answer to a question that hadn't even occurred to me. Having been married for 23 years and lived together for 25 years, you will learn almost everything about a person, even if you did not pay much attention to it. But at that moment, I suddenly realized some peculiarities in my wife's actions that I hadn't paid attention to before. These recent oddities in Tracy's behavior now looked like pieces of a puzzle that I was trying to put together. This realization took me by surprise, because a few minutes ago I thought that I had a perfect marriage with an almost perfect woman. Tracy and I were not only spouses but also best friends, lovers, and devoted parents of our two wonderful children. Unlike many couples, we could spend countless days together, never getting tired of each other's presence. Our conversations covered a wide range of topics, from intimate issues to historical events, and we found laughter in various aspects of these discussions. I've always appreciated the idea that the best way to assess marital compatibility is to go on a long car trip with your potential spouse. We were both in good shape, and we had the stamina to satisfy each other's desires. In the bedroom, Tracy and I were the perfect couple, and if you asked me, I would say that our intimate life was exceptional. Not only did we come together physically, but the emotional connection played an important role in our intimate encounters. We knew about each other's desires, fantasies, and boundaries, which made exploring new things even more exciting. Our communication was open and honest, which allowed us to satisfy each other's needs and keep the flame of passion burning. And although our initial infatuation turned into a deep, comfortable love, it did not diminish the feeling we had in bed. Moreover, the absence of distractions and responsibilities in the status of free families gave us the opportunity to indulge our desires more often. Our commitment to fitness has become another factor that has intensified our intimate experiences. Regular trips to the gym helped us not only maintain our physical attractiveness, but also gave us the energy and stamina to fully enjoy intimate moments. We both tried to stay in shape, not only for our own sake, but also for the pleasure that it brought to our relationship. Tracy and I were the perfect example of a couple who managed to maintain a full and passionate intimate life. Our compatibility, both physical and emotional, as well as the desire to keep the flame in the relationship, made us an enviable couple. Therefore, if you are lucky enough to find such a person, my advice is to hold on to him tightly and cherish the incredible bond that you share. At the age of 45, Tracy and I were in great physical shape. Tracy had long blonde curls, firm breasts, and a slender figure. Although she may have gained about 15 pounds since the birth of our children, everything was still fine. In the same way, I've gained another 20 pounds of muscle since I was a schoolboy. With 25 years of wife-pleasuring experience, everything seemed to be in order. But something changed a few months ago. Surprisingly, it was a change for the better, so I didn't wonder. I've never thought about it before. Although Tracy was always willing and active in our intimate meetings, she rarely took the initiative. Suddenly, she took the initiative as often as I did and the physical connection between us became unprecedented. But our relationship was no longer an expression of love, but rather just a sexual act. It was amazing, but our priorities have changed. I didn't ask myself any questions at the time, 
Now that I think about it, I realize that it was a mistake. Whenever Tracy and Rafe walked together, they were always five feet apart. Thanks to this new understanding, I was able to notice that Tracy's radiance increased whenever she was near Rafe, even in my presence. Although it quickly faded away when I appeared, as soon as Tracy moved away from me, she found another companion. Throughout the event, I imperceptibly kept my eyes on this couple, although it did not require much effort. Tracy didn't seem to pay attention to everyone else when Rafe was around. I've never seen her looking for me in a crowd. Throughout the evening she tried to make subtle physical contact with Rafe at every opportunity. At first I was nervous and afraid, but as I became more and more convinced of the undeniable truth that was opening up before my eyes, my anger reached its peak. The sight before me meant the potential demise of my marriage. With great difficulty, I managed to pull my wife away from Rafe, and around 11 p.m., I reluctantly pulled her away from him. Her expression was far from pleased when I approached and informed her that it was time to leave. Anger flashed in her eyes before she left, but not so quickly that I didn't notice her gaze. 23 years of married life. Normally, our conversations during the trip home were effortless, but this time I deliberately kept silent, waiting for Tracy to start the discussion herself. She seemed to be lost in thought for a while, looking out the car window. It was only when she noticed the awkward silence that she abruptly broke the void by starting a superficial conversation about the unfortunate fashion preferences of the college president's wife. I didn't take much part in the discussion. Fatigue overwhelmed me when Tracy blurted out, I'm incredibly tired, as soon as we get home I'll go straight to bed. And so, I was left alone with myself. I couldn't figure out if she was deliberately avoiding our evening conversation, or if she wanted me to go to bed so she could deal with the disappointment on her own. Anyway, I didn't take the bait, and informed her that I was going to watch TV instead. Apparently she was disappointed with my decision. The next day, Saturday, I had the whole day to work in the yard, and I had enough time to calm down and think about the situation. If Tracy guessed that our universe was more complicated than she thought, she hit it perfectly. The next week, there was a subtle tension at home. For my part, I tried to stay calm, but I found myself using the Find My Phone app on my iPhone about six times a day. Each time, Tracy ended up exactly where she was supposed to be, figuratively speaking. At night, she seemed willing to engage in intimate relationships. Although she seemed a little reserved on the first night, she quickly returned to her previous behavior. As expected, I provided her with satisfaction by giving her a lot of pleasure. But when Monday came, everything remained unchanged. And on Tuesday, the Find My Phone app informed me that Tracy had returned home during her lunch break. Fifteen minutes later, I quietly entered the house to make sure of the crushing reality that my marriage was over. From the sounds coming from our bedroom, I didn't have to climb the stairs to make sure that Tracy's companion was undoubtedly Rafe. Oh my god, Rafe! Tracy exclaimed during their intimate moment. She exclaimed passionately, My god, darling, you are truly exceptional! This last remark deeply hurt me and served as a test for my self-control as I resisted the urge to break into the bedroom and harm this despicable person. Still, I refrained knowing full well that once I got out, I wouldn't be able to stop until I took the life of one of them. And I didn't deserve to be imprisoned, says Tracy. I understand that this may seem selfish, but I want to be completely honest when I say that my love for my husband surpasses everything in the world. For 25 years, I have cherished him deeply and hoped that I would love him for another 25 years. But I must admit that I also have a lover who brings great joy into my life. This presence is so wonderful that I can't bring myself to let it go, even though I realize that eventually, I will have to make this difficult decision. To save my marriage, I did it. The thought that Mike, my amazing husband, would find out about my infidelity would undoubtedly crush him. Therefore, I resorted to all possible measures to hide my misconduct. But I wasn't naive enough to believe that I could elude detection indefinitely. 
I knew perfectly well that the longer this deception went on, the more likely it would be exposed. Mike has been my steadfast support for a quarter of a century. Our union lasted for 23 years, during which we had two wonderful children. He was not only my best friend, but also my soulmate, as well as an incredible lover. We shared everything and laughed endlessly together. But recently everything has changed. Meeting Rafe Searcy was unexpected, and it completely changed my life. Rafe, 30 years old, tall, toned build, short brown hair and delicate gray eyes, entered the administration building a few days before the start of classes. Although he was attractive, he was not the epitome of charm like George Clooney. Rafe occupied my thoughts throughout the day, making it impossible to focus on anything else. When I got home, I poured out my desire on Mike, almost overwhelmed by his passion. When Mike fell into a deep and contented slumber, I couldn't bring myself to admit that I hadn't thought about him during our intimate moments. Over the next two weeks, I continued to mentally engage in intimate relationships with Rafe, pushing them to the limit. But the following Wednesday, when my beloved husband had to leave town for the night, an opportunity arose. I knew perfectly well that my act was morally terrible. I was shaking with nerves when I called Rafe on Monday morning, plucking up the courage to invite him to lunch on Wednesday afternoon. Before I called, I carefully checked Rafe's schedule and made sure that he had no classes on Wednesday afternoon. I even took an administrative day off to be able to meet with him. On the long-awaited day, Rafe and I met in a cozy Italian restaurant, where we had dinner with pleasure, talking animatedly and laughing sincerely. I couldn't help laughing and tried not to touch his hands while we were talking. Blushing deeply, I felt like an innocent girl on a first date. Although Rafe and I hadn't discussed anything intimate, he was well aware that there was a burning anticipation between us. In response, he often smiled, briefly took my hand, and sometimes grinned mischievously. It was obvious that he felt the same undeniable connection. True to his gentlemanly nature, Rafe decided to pay the bill, and then quietly asked, Where do we go next? Without thinking, I answered in a voice that radiated more confidence than it actually was. To my house. It's only a ten-minute drive from here. Leave your car and I'll be happy to get behind the wheel. The realization that Mike would not be home until Thursday evening brought me great relief in connection with the upcoming event. But I couldn't deny that I was feeling nervous. As a 45-year-old mother of two, I realized that my body did not have the youthful maturity that Rafe was probably used to. Despite my deep love for Mike, the time I spent with Rafe was inevitable. I didn't want to deprive myself of the pleasure it promised, and I didn't feel any guilt about it. After putting the car in the garage and closing the door, I started the next 10 hours, which turned out to be one of the most exciting moments in my life. The bond between Rafe and me was undeniable, and every experience we shared was unusual. Despite the fact that I was not an innocent girl when I met Mike, Rafe completely surpassed all previous intimate encounters. But when Rafe finally took an Uber to get his car, I felt completely weak and emotionally exhausted. Memories of this moment include a lot of screaming and a few tears. I have a strong feeling that I initiated the meeting, although I cannot fully confirm this. To be honest, I can't even promise that it was on my behalf. It made me realize what it was like to be completely consumed by desire. I really wanted this experience. Tracy, you are an extraordinary woman. It was undoubtedly the most intense intimate experience of my life, says Rafe. When Tracy McGowan contacted me, I immediately understood her intentions. I sensed her interest when we first met in the office a couple of weeks ago. I had a strong feeling that we would have an intimate relationship after lunch, although I did not speak about it directly. Tracy was undoubtedly an attractive woman, with a beautiful face, ample breasts, and long blonde hair. She may have had a few extra pounds, but that didn't diminish my attraction to her in the least. When I saw her, I noticed the rings adorning her fingers, but I understood that these marriage symbols did not mean her absence from the dating scene. Married women often have a wealth of experience, 
and sometimes eccentricity can lead them astray. We had lunch together with pleasure, and after that she invited me to her house to indulge in passionate intimacy in the marital bed during the day. It turned out that her husband had gone on a business trip, which allowed us to expand our physical connection beyond a simple lunch rendezvous. I found that she was the most physically receptive woman I had ever encountered. As the Uber drove me back to the car in the restaurant parking lot, I longed for another day like this. I didn't know yet that there would be countless more days ahead, says Mike. Tracy's deceptive nature took me by surprise. For the next week, she skillfully kept the facade of the perfect wife while I quietly prepared for the upcoming divorce. Tracy's deceptive nature took me by surprise. For the next week, she skillfully kept the facade of the perfect wife while I quietly prepared for the upcoming divorce. On Wednesday morning, I met with a lawyer who informed me that Tracy would be served with a lawsuit next Wednesday. Despite the fact that we live in a state where there is no guilt, I decided to sue on the basis of adultery. I admit, a somewhat petty choice. I couldn't figure out what I had done that made my wife throw herself into the arms of another man. Perhaps it was because he was 15 years younger than me. Anyway, this affair wasn't a one-time drunken mistake. To further confirm my suspicions, I checked the Find Phone app, which showed that Tracy had gone home for lunch three times in the last 10 days. I didn't have to be physically present to realize that these lunch breaks weren't limited to cheese sandwiches. The thought made me chuckle to myself. During this period, I accidentally looked into the diner in search of a pair of cinnamon and brown sugar cakes. But to my horror, I did not find any. The day before, I ate the penultimate package, leaving only one. I also knew that Tracy despised cakes, so it was clear that Rafe had not only had an affair with my wife, but had also taken my damn cakes. Damn him, says Tracy. Thursday morning came, and I woke up feeling amazing after the most incredible intimate encounter of my life. Logically, I should have been consumed with guilt, but all I wanted was more. I decided to wait until noon before calling Rafe. My husband won't be home until 9 o'clock. If you can come, I'll be free by 5, and we'll have time for another round, maybe even two, I said, trying to sound cheerful. Rafe replied, appreciating a woman who knows what she wants. Get your car in the garage. We indulged in slow, passionate lovemaking during the first round, followed by an even more intense, intimate moment during the second. It was just as incredible as the previous day. Rafe left around 7.30 p.m. In a hurry, I quickly disassembled the bed and changed the sheets for the second time in two days. I carefully put both sets of sheets in the bottom of the laundry basket. A surge of satisfaction swept over me as I stepped into the refreshing shower. But my blissful solitude was short-lived when Mike walked in the door 90 minutes later. I immediately hugged my husband tightly, feeling overwhelming love for him. But I couldn't shake the guilt when Mike impatiently led me into the bedroom for intimacy. It was a completely new experience for me to get into physical intimacy with two different men in one day. I have to admit, it was exciting. It was incredible, Mike, I whispered with satisfaction as we hugged after the second passionate intimacy of the evening, and I really meant it. Mike was a wonderful lover in his own right, but the bond I shared with Rafe was something extraordinary. It seemed like we were doing something completely different than Mike and me. I didn't feel guilty for being involved in something so unusual. In my mind, being close to Rafe was completely separate from my life with my husband. With Mike, it was a bond based on deep emotions. And with Rafe, it all came down to incredible physical sensations. We indulged in them twice a week, knowing full well that it could not last indefinitely. But I intended to enjoy every moment while it lasted says Mike. I knew that Tracy was supposed to receive the divorce papers on Wednesday at 10 a.m. It took two minutes before my phone finally rang. When I answered, Tracy's voice broke out in anger, and she firmly stated that she did not want to get a divorce. And I don't want a lying woman to be my wife, I replied calmly. Life doesn't always give us what we want, does it? She demanded an explanation, but I had already made a decision for myself. We need to discuss this matter, 
Tracy sobbed. I took matters into my own hands because you neglected our vows and our relationship. Therefore, there is no need to discuss your decision further, I said, ending the conversation. I could finally focus on productive work. Unfortunately, when I returned home, I was anticipating the confrontation that awaited me, and Tracy did not let me down. Shouldn't you have talked to me before you started the divorce process? Tracy screamed as soon as I entered the house. Considering that we've been married for 23 years, what exactly do you want to say? It turned out that the 23 years we spent together didn't matter to you, considering how often you betrayed me. I replied with a sharp remark. Tracy's watery eyes and smudged makeup showed that she had been crying. I didn't feel much joy either. I truly love you, Mike. What I shared with Rafe was purely physical. It's my choice that I made for myself, she concluded. Tracy looked deeply worried, to say the least. I'm sorry for hurting you, but I think you're overreacting. Can we talk about this? Tracy, I hardly understand what you want to say. You've cheated many times, maybe even more than I know, I said. I understand that this may seem terrible. I understand that it was an easy decision for you, Tracy, I repeated. Could you clarify it for me? I thought my sarcasm was obvious, but Tracy seemed encouraged by my response and even smiled at me. I can't explain it, but it's like we have some kind of unusual physical connection. Presumably this is the best intimate experience in life, I heard. Her eyes widened, and for the first time she looked scared. Do you understand that? What is it? She asked, tears and fear obvious at the same time. Can I repeat this for you? I was at home last week. You two were so engrossed that you didn't notice me. You can't fix that mistake now. She showed prudence by shyly lowering her eyes. Mike, what I feel for you is purely physical. My love for you is immeasurable, and it is difficult to express it in words. Can we at least try to communicate? I know I hurt you, but I'm sure you still love me. She was right about the last statement, and it caused her great pain. Despite the fact that I no longer love her as much as I did two weeks ago, my affection for her still persists. It's impossible for 25 years of loving someone to disappear in an instant, says Tracy. Despite the awareness of the risk, I was stunned when the divorce papers were brought to me at work on Wednesday afternoon. The revelation that Mike knew about my affair threw me into disbelief. To my amazement, he not only knew about it, but also had evidence of our intimacy captured on video. The situation worsened when I realized that he had overheard me saying that Rafe was the best I had ever experienced. Swearing under my breath, I realized that I would not be able to give my husband a satisfactory explanation. The bond between Rafe and me was undeniable, but deep down, I knew that Mike's love for me would eventually prevail. Trying to find a solution, I suggested the idea of letting Rafe stay as an outsider lover while we try to save our marriage as a last resort. In search of professional advice, I suggested consulting with a psychologist. Surprisingly, Mike agreed with this suggestion. But our first meeting with the consultant did not go as expected. Even though she was a woman, like Mike, she couldn't understand the intensity of my attraction to Rafe. I was hoping for a more sympathetic response, perhaps support from my side. After I told my story, she turned to me with a question that struck a chord with me. So, your wedding vows meant nothing to you, Mrs. McGowan? What is it? she asked. I explained, no, they mean everything to me, but this situation is unlike anything I've encountered before. I tried to explain that this is akin to an increased feeling of desire and passion, almost like under the influence of a strong drug. But it was clear from her expression that she doubted the authenticity of my words. Mikey's expression changed to one of disbelief. Although it is often claimed that men allow their impulses to guide them, the consultant calmly noted that women are no less guilty of this, as evidenced by today's number of divorces. Although temptation exists, most people realize that they can resist it. But you have decided to give in to your primal desires. I couldn't understand how this woman was hinting that I lacked self-control. 
It felt like a direct insult, akin to being called a slut. And then she asked a question that seemed to finally confirm my thoughts about the upcoming divorce. If your husband Mike cannot forgive you and accept you into his life, will you be able to resist your physical desires and remain faithful to him? Damn it. I hoped that this woman would support me, but I sat paralyzed, afraid even to answer her question. Mike will figure out any untruth. He knew me better than any lie detector. I love you, Mike. Maybe we can work on this together. I don't value this predicament, but I feel I have to solve it. I have never experienced a more pleasant, intimate contact in my life. I beg you not to ask me to leave this. Tears were streaming down my face as I finished my words. I shot a quick glance at Mike, hoping to catch a glimmer of wavering determination. In the end, he confessed that his love for me still hadn't faded. But all I saw in his eyes was indifference. I'm sorry, Tracy. I really love you deeply. But I can't let you betray me, and I can't forgive your past actions. I'm sorry I wasn't enough for you. I confessed to Mike. You're all I need, Mike. I love you. But the truth is, I didn't feel the same love for him. If sacrificing our relationship means keeping us together, then I'm ready to let him go. Please don't leave us. But he replied, I didn't do it. You're the one who left us as soon as you slept with him. He refused to take the blame, pointing out my selfishness. It became clear that in the end, it was always about me. I realized that my love for him did not match his love for me. Two weeks after our last meeting with the counselor, I found myself in my bedroom with Rafi. I wasn't sure if Mike was watching us, but at that moment I didn't care. The day before, I had noticed Rafi on campus and impulsively asked him out on a lunch date. Our physical connection was undoubtedly intense. In the end, six months later, Mike's divorce was finalized. Throughout this time, Rafe and I have been involved in countless passionate encounters. There has always been an incredible emotional connection between us. Mike was my main weakness. I adored him, but my desire was for Rafe. I longed for him tirelessly. I knew I would never be able to get Mike back because of this infatuation. Mike didn't really love me enough to let me have Rafe, says Mike. It was incredible to believe that Tracy actually wanted me to let her date her lover and still be married to me. If you really love me, Tracy pleaded. What kind of nonsense is this? Don't even think about it. Forget. There's no way we're going to stay married, period. Maybe I was just a cuckold unknowingly. I'm not going to be stupid, but I have to admit that the marriage counselor we contacted stunned me. Contrary to Tracy's hopes, she seemed disconnected from reality. In our first session, she practically insulted my wife using derogatory language. Unfortunately, the situation did not improve further. After the fourth session, she abruptly stopped our classes, saying that I would never compromise, and expressing her support for me. I saw the devastation on Tracy's face when the counselor instructed her to stop the sessions. I'm not sure if Tracy asked my daughters to support her, but they sincerely tried to do it. Dad, you're tearing our family apart. My youngest burst into tears when I told her about it. No, dear, it's not me who's destroying our family. Your mother did it. I'm just making it legal. Her face contorted, and she furrowed her brows, clearly lost in thought. You're probably right, Dad, she finally admitted, says Rafe. I wasn't going to ruin Tracy's marriage, but I saw it as her husband's problem, not mine. Although I recognized her deep love for him, our physical connection was extraordinary, and the closeness seemed almost unreal. And if she was attracted to me, I was more than ready to reciprocate her feelings. Even though I understood his reluctance to be a cuckold, it was his and Tracy's business, not mine. Tracy became estranged from me for two weeks after Mike initiated the divorce proceedings. When he persisted and refused to reconcile, our intimate relationship resumed. Surprisingly, the situation improved, because when Mike was no longer with her, Tracy focused all her attention on me physically. I have to admit that our intimate relationship with Tracy was incomparable. It was the best thing I've ever experienced. But despite her skill in bed, 
I did not believe that our romantic relationship would last long. At 45, she was not suitable for me to marry, and I had plans to create my own family. She has already raised two adult children, and this made me doubt what she is capable of. If she treats the person, she says she loves above all else in the world in this way. Even though I didn't discuss it with Tracy, I kept looking for Miss Cersei. Tracy was already going through a lot of grief from losing Mike, and I didn't want to burden her anymore. But everything changed when, almost a year after Tracy's divorce, I bumped into Lucy Rolston. Lucy and I, a 24-year-old girl with short brown hair and a graceful dancer's physique, immediately found a common language. At first, I decided not to tell Tracy that I had Lucy, but after about two months, I finally confessed. Although I understood that I had caused Tracy mental suffering by my actions, it turned out that her love for me was not sincere. Although our physical connection was undeniable, our emotional connection only resembled that of close friends. When Lucy and I decided to devote ourselves exclusively to each other, I felt it necessary to inform Tracy that our relationship was over. But after sharing this news with her, Tracy tearfully accused me of leaving her husband because of me. However, this accusation is far from being true, says Tracy. I was heartbroken when Rafe informed me that he wanted to be in a relationship with Lucy and no longer wanted to participate in intimate moments with me. For you, I made the difficult decision to leave my husband for you. Tears were streaming down my face as he shared the news with me, and there was a hint of sympathy in Rafe's expression, or maybe something else. No, that's not quite right. You say you left your husband to have a physical relationship with me, but that's not my choice. My personal preference is to have a beloved spouse and family, Rafe said. I was heartbroken when Rafe informed me that he wanted to be in a relationship with Lucy and no longer wanted to participate in intimate moments with me. For you, I made the difficult decision to leave my husband for you. Tears were streaming down my face as he shared the news with me, and there was a hint of sympathy in Rafe's expression, or maybe something else. No, that's not quite right. You say you left your husband to have a physical relationship with me, but that's not my choice. My personal preference is to have a beloved spouse and family, Rife said. But the consequences of this decision were terrible for me. When my children found out the truth about our situation, it wasn't easy for them, and it created an uncomfortable atmosphere for all of us. When Mike and I broke off our relationship, he didn't hide the truth in front of our children. He frankly told me that I had repeatedly cheated on him, and all this in pursuit of more pleasant, intimate sensations for their mother. It is clear that at first the children were upset, but over time they came to terms with the situation. But when I told them a year and a half later that Rafe had left me to start a family with a younger woman, it only underlined my sense of hopelessness, even in my own eyes. I did not ask the children to hide this information from their father, but I sincerely hoped that they would not disclose it. I must admit that I have some doubts about the recent turn of events in my life. During the Christmas holidays when my children returned home, my eldest daughter casually asked if she had met my lover. It was at this point that I confessed that we were no longer together. In response, my daughter made a rather pointed remark, hinting that I had sacrificed a 25-year relationship with their father for several years of intimacy with a younger man. More precisely, she corrected herself, several years of the most intense, intimate experience in my life, which made me grimace with displeasure. I was speechless and looked down at the floor. Losing Rafe didn't affect me as deeply as losing Mike. Rafe was an amazing lover, but Mike was my soulmate, my everything. Returning home to an empty apartment after work was heartbreaking, but at least I could look forward to sensational meetings in the bedroom several times a week. But when Rafe left, I felt completely empty. The loneliness was unbearable, and in search of solace, I decided to go on a date. I was shocked when I discovered that most of the men involved were over 30 years old, and some were even in their 20s. Perhaps I am a middle-aged woman who is 47 years old, and I was not as unattractive as I thought at first. 
The company of several men seemed pleasant to me, although none of them were even close to my former partner. Perhaps this is due to my long absence from the dating scene, but I have definitely noticed that over the past 25 years, men's expectations have changed, especially among the young. It seemed that they were expecting to have an intimate relationship on the first date. And if that didn't happen, a second date was usually out of the question. Not that I was prudent, but I also didn't want to get intimate with just anyone. For me, the time when sex was happening was important. In my opinion, it usually happened when both sides were comfortable, and my partners seemed to be quite satisfied. In particular, the younger gentlemen admired my ample breasts, and the older men seemed to enjoy the various caresses more. Most of our intimate encounters were purely physical, devoid of depth of emotional connection. Maybe my relationship didn't last long enough to experience true love. I craved the intimacy and passion that comes with making love. Talking to the children, I carefully asked about Mike, hoping to gather information unnoticed. It turned out that he was not related to anyone, and I had a hope to get him back. We've been in a great marriage for 23 years, so why wouldn't he consider dating me when he was open to hanging out with other divorced women? Although I understood that the odds were stacked against me, I realized that in this situation, I needed to take the initiative into my own hands. A few months later, I hesitantly told Mike during our phone conversation, Hey, Mike, maybe we'll have coffee together sometime. I understand that my actions have hurt you and I sincerely apologize for that, but I sincerely hope that we can restore our friendship and enjoy such simple moments as a cup of coffee or even a meal together. I sincerely miss our conversations and the time spent in your company. He answered cautiously, Of course, Tracy, I think we can do it. I miss your company too, and I think I'm in a better state now than before, says Mike. We set up our coffee date for the next Saturday. When Tracy walked into the Starbucks where we had agreed to meet, I couldn't help but notice how amazing she looked. It's been two years since we last saw each other, but time didn't seem to have affected her in any way. There were no signs of aging, and she seemed to have retained her previous weight. Her hair was cut to her shoulders, and a tight sweater accentuated her ample breasts. She was wearing minimal makeup, which only accentuated her natural beauty. When she came over, I got up from my seat to greet her. Not knowing if it was worth hugging her, she solved this dilemma by entering my personal space, gently kissing me on the cheek and hugging me. I hugged her back. How come no one took you away? I said involuntarily. She blushed and her charm shone. Probably not everyone has such great taste, she replied, smiling. We continued to order coffee. We both received a special cake as a gift, adding a sweet touch to our reunion. During the conversation, we touched on a huge number of topics that reminded us of the fascinating discussions we had when we were married. The exchange of opinions was so pleasant that we did not refuse a second cup of Starbucks coffee filled with caffeine. When we got up to leave, I couldn't help but express my delight. It was an amazing time, Tracy. How about we schedule lunch together for our next meeting? Surprised by my unexpected offer, she widened her eyes when she met mine. After some thought, she replied in a low tone, Of course it sounds wonderful. I plucked up the courage and called her, two weeks after our first conversation. We agreed to meet for lunch. It dawned on me that it's been over 25 years since I last went on a date. After my divorce from Tracy, I completely shut myself off from any romantic relationship. Although I pretended not to be moved by the breakup, deep down it shattered me. The wounds were still fresh, and I avoided any contact with the opposite sex. But on a sunny Saturday afternoon, something inside me pushed me to take a leap of faith and connect with her again. Tracy and I enjoyed lunch at our favorite Italian restaurant enjoying each other's company. Although I felt that she was eager for an invitation to my house, I walked her to her car in the parking lot instead. I kissed her on the cheek with a warm gesture, and then headed for my car. Time passed, and we had dinner together more than once in the future. But I deliberately refrained from further developments, as this allowed me to maintain a sense of power over the situation. From my point of view, 
the course of events after dinner has a significant impact on subsequent results. I didn't want to, and couldn't get around to it, says Tracy. It seems that Mike has become more intelligent over time. Despite the fact that we enjoyed spending time together, he never made an invitation to dinner. I was hoping that eventually he would decide to take this step, which could be a small step towards spending the night together. Considering that he wasn't dating anyone else, I thought that if I could make a deep impression on him, then I would have a chance to resume our relationship. Unfortunately, he never gave me the opportunity. Going to IHOP does not create an atmosphere for a bed together. Taking the hint, I decided to start dating others again. I guess I'll have to put up with it, says Mike. Tracy had such a profound effect on my emotions that it took me five whole years to start a new romantic relationship. I didn't see my dates with Tracy as dates, even though I knew about her expectations. One day, while going through various brands of tequila in my favorite liquor store, I felt that someone was next to me. It turned out that she was in the same search. She looked friendly enough. In an attempt to be friendly, I offered her my extensive knowledge of distilled spirits. I just wanted to lend a helping hand. Do you prefer to drink tequila in its pure form or make a cocktail? I asked, smiling. I never dilute good tequila. I drink it the same way as coffee. Pure, without additives, she replied. Margarita is suitable for social events, but when I really indulge, I prefer it without additives. Amazing. A woman with a secret. I have not met a single woman who appreciates tequila in its true form. When I first turned to face a woman, I couldn't help but be fascinated. She exuded self-confidence as she sipped tequila with elegance. Noticing the absence of rings on her left hand, I decided that she might be younger than me. Her curly, dark brown hair cascaded just below her shoulders, contrasting beautifully with her fair complexion and sparkling blue eyes. It seemed that she, like me, was of Irish descent. Caught off guard by my involuntary gaze, I returned to reality when I heard her voice and realized that she had asked me a question. It was a subtle, restrained question. When my senses returned, she grinned and my cheeks flushed. I apologized. I'm sorry. I was just thinking. The combination of different brands of tequila and a seductive woman who shared my love for this drink was a rare occurrence in my life. Her response was a wry smile, which made me think she might have changed her mind. But to my surprise, she continued the conversation. So, Mr. Tequila Snob, what kind of world is this? What is it? She asked with a touch of playfulness. Sighing, I muttered, Lucerville, USA, ma'am. And there it was, the word ma'am, slipping in almost automatically. Did you just call me ma'am? She asked incredulously. I was stunned by her reaction. Wow, do I look like your mother? She continued, her tone laced with sarcasm. I immediately felt remorse for my comment. I'm sorry about that. It's a matter of good manners. My parents are to blame. I explained, hoping to smooth things over. I wanted to assure her that she was nothing like my mother. I loved my mother to death, but even on her best days, she didn't look as good as you, I said, immediately regretting my words. I grimaced, anticipating her reaction. To my surprise, her expression changed to surprise and a sly smile. It made me realize that I had unwittingly complimented her. Looking at her more closely, I noticed her toned, sinuous body, which did not match her age. Suddenly I felt like a fool for underestimating her. So why, Mr. Loserville, a tequila snob to be polite, doesn't it seem like you won't have a problem finding a couple of dates? She teased. Her words hit me hard, reminding me of the five lonely years I spent after the divorce. I haven't been on a date for five years since I divorced my cheating wife. I confessed in a barely audible voice. Feeling awkward, she quickly apologized for her assumption. The atmosphere became tense, and an awkward silence fell between us. I was desperately looking for a way out of the impasse, realizing that I had neither a game nor witty remarks to defuse the situation. Fortunately, just when I thought the conversation was doomed, something changed. 
Well, do you have any recommendations? What is it? She asked, taking another sip of tequila. Personally, I love Don Julio Blanco and Fieri's latest creation, Sammy Hagar Santo Tequila. But if this is really a special case, choose Don Julio 42. It's a little expensive, but believe me, it's worth it, I replied. Curious, she asked, and how much is Don Julio 42? Only $85 a bottle, I replied. She nodded, seemingly ending our conversation. Feeling a surge of spontaneity, I reached for a bottle of Santo from the shelf. Then, throwing caution to the wind, I held out my hand to her. Mike McGowan, how about we go into the next room and I buy you some tequila? This way you can make a more informed decision, I suggested, giving her the sincerest look. Grinning mischievously, she looked me up and down before accepting my invitation. We went to a nearby bar, where we spent an evening tasting tequila, which lasted for the next two hours. After leaving the bar, I made sure to buy some snacks for us. Holding my smartphone in my hands, I scrolled through a whirlwind of thoughts about the coming week. On the one hand, I was glad to have the contact details of a beautiful woman, but on the other hand, it meant that I would have to summon the courage to call her and arrange a date. The last time I went on a date seemed like a hundred years ago, almost as long ago as the American Revolution. I was panicking, wondering where to take her, maybe to a restaurant, or maybe to an ice rink or bowling alley. My thoughts were in a mess. Despite having a stable job and a decent income, I couldn't help but feel anxious. Although I generally got along well with people and was aware of current affairs, just the thought of dating made me sweat profusely. It became obvious that some things never change, especially when it comes to dating. Women have full power and are well aware of it. At the same time, it was worth noting that she willingly gave me her number without any compulsion. This should be considered a positive thing, right? Internal disputes lasted for several days and threatened to drag on even longer if fate had not intervened. While working in the office, I unexpectedly ran into Faith, who was disguised as a Shortino bathtub. While thinking about what to do with Rose, I accidentally bumped into Anna, causing her to stumble in high heels. Reacting quickly, I held out my hands to her, apologizing. Surprised by my presence, Anna said she wouldn't have noticed me if we hadn't bumped into each other, emphasizing my relatively small stature. Over time, Anna and I began to talk sometimes. I often gave her fatherly advice on various issues, and also asked her to tell me how to understand the younger generation. When I needed to explain something related to the generation gap, instead of turning to my own children, I turned to Anna. She explained to me patiently and clearly, focusing on my 50-year-old mentality. Feeling inferior, I muttered softly, yes, actually, feeling like an imbecile fool. Anna studied my face intently, as if deciphering a hidden message. Suddenly, her familiar smile broke out. I was puzzled because this happened a lot. Perhaps this bewilderment was caused by a romantic relationship in which a girl or a woman could participate. Anna voiced her thoughts in her usual melodious tone, suggesting some kind of connection. I nodded in agreement, continuing to think out loud. After a few minutes, she came to a decision. Okay, tell me everything after work at Murphy's, she announced, making sure I understood her seriousness. But remember, no ridicule, otherwise you will be left alone with an icy drink. Later that day, we got back together at Murphy's. Anna was sitting across from me, radiating cheerfulness, and I was nervously confused in my explanations about Rose. So you're saying that you haven't dated anyone in the five years since the divorce? With no one? Anna exclaimed in disbelief. Wow, I knew you were a little slow, but I had no idea to what extent. When she imitated me, I couldn't help but feel embarrassed about her teasing. But deep down, I knew that Anna's words were true. She was not only right, but also genuinely caring and kind to me. Curious about the timing, she asked me, When did she give you her number? Recently? This month or this year? I replied shyly, Just five days ago, Anna. Trying to defuse the situation, I playfully warned her, 
If you keep being smart I may have to spank you. Although my warning was half serious she replied in a mischievous tone, Well, we'll both like it. Her comment made me blush. Switching to a more serious tone she asked, Seriously Mike, what's holding you back? I calmed her down. You're right, I shouldn't let fear stop me. I have a lot of potential ahead of me. I should just call her. For the next 30 minutes, Anna enthusiastically shared with me the various activities that her friends do on dates. Despite my curiosity, I refrained from taking out my notebook and making any notes. At some point she asked, Can you dance? Who else has three left legs? Mistaking her comment for a negative response, she continued, You know, women genuinely appreciate it when a man asks them to dance. It's a subtle way to speed up communication, she explained, smiling broadly. Can you believe it? Seriously. I used to think it was just an urban legend, I said skeptically. But you're saying it's true, aren't you? 100%, she nodded. A mischievous grin appeared on her face. Oh, absolutely, she replied. Consider it a kind of foreplay. I playfully plugged my ears, humming la 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 to drown out the conversation. She glanced at me, but her grin only widened. Then she blurted out, And don't forget to bring your contraceptives, she said, not taking her eyes off me. You can never be too prepared. Rolling my eyes, I replied sarcastically, Yes, ma'am. When I got home that evening, I decided to call Rose. We had a date scheduled for Saturday, and Anna advised me to be honest if Rose asked about my previous marriage. It was strange to discuss such personal details with someone I barely knew, but Rose turned out to be understanding and compassionate. She shared her own heartbreaking story about her 15-year marriage, which ended when she caught her husband cheating with their neighbor, says Tracy. During the visit to the doctor's office, I could not get rid of the feeling of humiliation, despite the fact that the physical pain from contracting syphilis was relatively bearable. Although the doctor and the two nurses I spoke with were undoubtedly professionals, I felt their overwhelming anxiety as they dealt with my situation. The situation only got worse when I had to provide a list of six recent sexual partners that I had to report. I couldn't help but curse my luck for having to send six messages. When I heard one nurse talking quietly to another looking at my test results for the first time, an idea came to my mind. It's a good thing she didn't say it out loud, considering her age. I have to admit her comments sounded pretty harsh. Although I didn't dwell on it, in recent years I have certainly accepted my single life. After Rafe left and Mike divorced, I may have lost my way a little. It seems like I was looking for someone to fill the void left by Mike and Rafe. But if this scenario turned out to be true, then there would be no equivalent experience. How could I fill the void left by my 23-year relationship with Mike? And how can I replicate the intense, intimate chemistry I shared with Rafe? It's not clear. Perhaps I subconsciously substituted quantity for quality. I never really thought about the extent of my intimate relationships until I was asked to reveal the number and identity of my partners. Undoubtedly, it was stupid and irresponsible to engage in unprotected sexual contact with most of them. I've never considered myself promiscuous or irresponsible because of alcohol. I always controlled my actions and tried to choose partners who looked clean and well-groomed. But this is a common story. When you get into an intimate relationship with someone, you unwittingly connect with everyone they've been with lately. It was stupid of me not to realize that. Fortunately, I didn't have to disclose to Mike the information about what happened to me, says Mike. About a year after our first date, Rose and I tied the knot, but we both carried the remnants of trust issues. Not that I was happy, but I wasn't happy either. I was always sober enough to understand what I was doing, and I always chose guys who looked clean and well-groomed. But it's an old story. When you sleep with someone, you also sleep with everyone they've slept with lately. I just never thought, you idiot. At least I didn't have to tell anyone about my problem, Mike. Rose and I got married about a year after our first date. We both still had trust issues, but we coped with these difficulties with love and under the guidance of a wonderful therapist. With tenderness, I gently pushed Rose aside, and we settled on our sides, 
closing our eyes as we both tried to catch our breath. At the age of 55, after 25 years of marriage, making love once a week seemed enough. We treasured these moments, spending another 10 minutes kissing and hugging each other before falling asleep. To say that Rose saved me would be a huge understatement. After my divorce from Tracy, I was confused, not knowing how to navigate the dating industry. Rose gave me the opportunity to find my way, sometimes literally, and over time we began to grow together, forming an indissoluble bond. Although I do not presume to say this, I believe that I have found my soulmate, who accompanies me on this path of graceful aging, says Tracy. I became more careful in choosing partners when I re-entered the dating scene after failures in my personal life. Menopause probably played a role in this. In addition, despite the fact that I still looked decent at the age of 50, people in their 20s and 30s no longer showed interest in me. It became obvious that there was intense competition between single women between the ages of 40 and 50, since the number of available men in this age range was significantly less. If you remember how I looked at it a few years ago, then anyone who would have asked would have received a completely different answer. I was ready to announce the conclusion of the contract, assuring them that everything was settled. My plan was to grow old with my beloved husband, Mike. But my own stupidity prevented their implementation. I greatly overestimated my influence on Mike, mistaking his kindness as a sign of vulnerability. I believed that his love for me was so deep that he would forgive me all my mistakes. As a result, a few years ago I decided to move to a nursing home, as my former home turned out to be too spacious for a single inhabitant. I have the pleasure of seeing my children and grandchildren every few months. The relationship that I maintain with my children was gradually restored and returned to normal, which took several years. As for Mike and me, we managed to maintain a friendly relationship, although we stopped our regular lunches because I realized that they did not bridge the gap between us. Mike eventually started dating again after years of isolation from others. I have to admit, I feel a pang of jealousy when I watch the way he looks at Rose. But during the holidays, when the whole family gets together, I can't help but notice the adoring looks and sweet manners they communicate with. It makes me sick. It should have been with me. Was it worth it? I ask myself. I never liked the answer. One evening I was alarmed by my wife's condition. She had been silent all week, and on Friday evening she seemed even more distant. Worried about her, I started a conversation. Honey, what's wrong? You've been upset for over a week now. She replied, It's okay, I was just trying to figure something out. Worried, I kept insisting, You're making me worry, honey. Could you tell me what's bothering you? Carl, I think it's time for us to think about a temporary break, she said calmly. I was stunned, as if she had just thrown a ball in my direction. A temporary breakup? Where did this idea come from? What do you mean? Why now? I couldn't help but raise my voice, trying my best to contain my emotions. But she just kept explaining her feelings. I couldn't believe it. Why is this happening right now and what have I done to cause it? I was completely shocked. I feel like I need some time for myself, Carl. I've been feeling like I'm suffocating for a long time and I need a break. I need to sort everything out in my head. But a temporary break? This is a big step towards divorce. Why didn't you bring this up earlier? Did I do something or didn't I do something? It's not about you, Carl. It's about me. I need to find myself. I know it sounds selfish and corny, but I need to figure out what I really want and what I need in life. Do you want to leave me? I asked. No, she replied. I just need to be alone for a while to figure out what I need and what I want. Maybe we could go to a family psychologist? I suggested. I don't want to share my problems with anyone else, she replied. I just need time to think. Six months? Where will you live? I know it's going to be difficult, but I need time to think about it, she said. In six months, I will know exactly what I want to do. I know that you feel a greater need for intimacy than I do. But how are we going to solve this problem? Besides, it seems inevitable that in six months we will find ourselves in a divorce court. 
I can't stand the thought of not being able to see you for so long. We need to find a way to stay in touch and support each other during this difficult time. I want to be a part of your journey to self-discovery, my dear. Physical intimacy is not a priority for me, Carl. I understand that this may be difficult for you, but we will find a way to regulate this aspect of our relationship. Maybe we can make monthly dates to spend time together. Once a month may not be enough for us. We should try to see and communicate with each other at least once a week. If we see each other less often, it can lead to problems in our relationship. It is important for us to keep in touch so as not to move away from each other. I hope you can understand me, Carl. I don't want to ruin our marriage, I just need time to figure things out. Are you suggesting that we meet other people during this period? No, that's not what I meant. At this time we must remain faithful to each other. Paige, how can I resist the temptation? How can you resist if you have more needs? It's not just about intimacy, Carl. I understand that, but intimacy is the most important aspect of our relationship. If we go without it for six months, it can lead us to sin. We can both become vulnerable to temptation. Please, let's reconsider this decision. Let's seek the advice of a psychologist, both individually and together. Please don't say no. Paige, our business is on the verge of success, as we have always dreamed of. We are so close to the moment when you will no longer have to work, and we can finally achieve financial security for life. But if we get divorced, it will not only ruin our business, it will also break me. I love you, Carl. I can't bear the thought of losing you, Paige. Please, let's find another way out. I'm sorry, but I need to be alone to think about everything. If you're going to insist on this, then we should consult with a lawyer on Monday. Why do we need a lawyer? If we're going to break up, then we need to resolve legal issues. For example, any infidelity during our separation can lead to divorce without any property rights for the wrong party. What? I have no intention of dating or being unfaithful, Carl. There's no reason for legal intervention. Actually, there is. And even if you don't plan on cheating, then you don't have to worry, do you? I don't think so. But what if one of us accidentally stumbles? That's what worries me, Paige. Your sexual attraction is higher than mine, and mine is already quite high. None of us can stand six months, especially if we only meet once a month. Carl, I'm not going to change your mind. If you think we should do this legally, then let's start on Monday. Paige, please, please change your mind. Today I will sleep in the guest bedroom. I've already rented an apartment and I'm moving in tomorrow. I had a restless night. I couldn't stop tossing and turning, wondering how everything went wrong. How did I not notice that Paige needed something? How did I not foresee this? How did it all start? After our first conversation, Paige refused to talk to me, and I felt lost. The next morning she quickly packed her things and left, leaving a phone number and a new address, after which she disappeared. When I was sitting alone in an empty house, the realization of what had happened hit me like a ton of bricks. My life went off course and I got lost. Monday turned out to be exhausting. Paige insisted on her loneliness, and the lawyer worked tirelessly to keep us safe. It was a difficult day, which was compounded by the fact that Paige felt like a stranger to me. Besides, my business was booming and I had little free time. That night, Paige disappeared from my life. It's been years since I've felt truly alone, but when Paige left, it hit me like a pile of rocks. She had a job and I knew a few of her colleagues, but otherwise I was completely alone. The first month without her was difficult. I threw myself into my work, spending endless hours in the office and hardly ever being at home. It felt like I was living in my office. Even my secretary and staff were worried about me. They saw how much Paige's departure had affected me and expressed their sympathy. No one could tell me how to fix the situation. Our first date was scheduled for Saturday evening. We gathered at the agreed place, and as soon as Paige parked the car in the usual place at the entrance, we went to dinner. Throughout the evening she remained reserved, making small talk only about the weather or her work. She casually asked about my job, but otherwise it was like a bad date. 
The most piquant moment was the feeling of indifference she radiated towards me, as if I meant nothing to her. This realization hurt me deeply. Thinking about it, I became more and more annoyed, and by the end of the date, I could hardly restrain myself from sarcastic remarks. I couldn't help but notice that she was constantly talking about some colleague, repeatedly mentioning his name and behaving differently when talking about him. This colleague was the son of the owner and held a high position in the company. Although Paige didn't obey him directly, he still had a certain amount of power over her. The more she talked about him, the more worried I became. Was her sudden desire to be alone a sign that she was thinking about cheating? About leaving me for another man? It was rumored that this guy was a famous hunter who successfully stalked many women, regardless of their relationship status. The abrupt change in Paige's behavior, combined with the man's reputation, made me feel uneasy. That evening she left with only a timid hug. When I got into the car I couldn't get rid of the feeling of fear lurking in me. I sat and thought, thinking about the consequences of her action. I was sure of my love for her and felt that she had the same feelings for me. But it was difficult for me to understand her behavior. At times like this, when I couldn't figure out the situation, I always turned to my brother for advice. He successfully developed his landscaping business into a huge enterprise and then sold it for a substantial sum. Thanks to competent investments, he became very wealthy. He successfully multiplied his income by five. At 41, he was already officially a semi-pensioner. I contacted him and we arranged to meet for lunch at the end of that week. When I returned to work on Monday, I found that I was working longer and longer without having the motivation that I had before. Without Paige in my life, all the years of hard work seemed pointless. After the separation, I felt as if my heart had turned to stone, and it was difficult for me to control my emotions. The absence of my wife was beginning to take its toll on me. It seemed that she had passed away, leaving a void in my life. My brother Dave, who was married twice and is now happily married to his second wife, has always been someone I looked up to. He had a lot of life experience, and it seemed that he understood everything. I thought I was lucky that he was my older brother. When he asked me how things were going, I couldn't help but express my disappointment. He mentioned that he had heard about my relationship problems with Paige. Yes, I'm sorry. Hello, no need to apologize. I'm here for you, brother. You mean a lot to me and I care about you. I would be upset if you didn't trust me. I'm at a loss, Dave. She threw it to me and left the next day. We had our first date after the breakup and it was a bad meeting. It seemed to me that I had met a ghost. It's like our marriage never happened. I'm really sorry, buddy. This is a difficult situation. What do you want to do next? I have to be honest with you. It looks like Paige is spending time with someone else. But that's not the main problem. According to her, I didn't do anything wrong. She just needs to be alone. When I suggested the idea of a legal divorce, she was upset at first but eventually agreed. I do not know what is happening to her. Did you work more than you should? No, I didn't work harder than usual until she left. Now I mostly live at work. Do you think maybe she has some personal problems? I'm not really sure. I don't see any medical problems, except that she has depression or something like that. I offered therapy, but she's not interested. Maybe she's dating someone else, Carl? I'm not sure, Dave. I don't think so, but I can't say for sure. I didn't see any signs of infidelity. It all happened so suddenly within one week. I'm here for you, Carl. If it's difficult, be sure to contact me. Good. I'll do that, Dave. Thank you for listening and talking to me. I still don't understand what happened to Paige. Maybe I should ask Brenda to contact her. Although Paige talked to Brenda for several hours, she didn't mention anything about me or our marriage. I think this is understandable because Brenda is my brother's wife. Unfortunately, our next date was just as bad as the first one. In fact, I ended our date ahead of schedule and just took her back to the house where I had originally picked her up. She looked unhappy when I made the decision to take her home, but I saw no point in prolonging the discomfort. She didn't engage in conversation with me, but led a monologue, and I couldn't stand it. Two months have passed without any progress in our relationship, only our feelings for each other have weakened. 
I was sure that our marriage was heading towards divorce. I tried to discuss her emotions with her, but she turned the conversation to work. My affairs and even the weather seemed to conspire against me. I felt disappointed and lost, not knowing how to get the old page back. Depression was coming, threatening to take over me. As they immersed themselves in their work, my employees became more and more concerned about my well-being. But I was too busy with Paige to pay attention to it. In search of solace, I visited Dave and Brenda several times over the next month. Brenda made sure that I ate right and took care of myself, and Dave did everything possible to help me. We were all puzzled by Paige's sudden change in behavior, and none of us knew what to do. Despite all this chaos, the thought of intimacy with anyone did not cross my mind. As our third date night approached after three months, I hesitantly called her, ready to end the relationship if she seemed the same to me as during previous dates. I was on the verge of giving up. After continuous work and worries, I was completely exhausted. Hi, this is Carl. Are you ready for our date, Paige? Oh, hi, Carl. I'm almost ready. Will you pick me up? She asked. Is it worth it? My words took her by surprise. What do you mean? Asked Paige. I mean, should I even bother? My disappointment was obvious. Our last two dates have been fruitless, Paige. You seem distant and unwilling to discuss our relationship. I'm your husband. Don't forget that. I reminded her. I know it was difficult, Carl. Just give me a few more months, Paige begged. I have come to some realizations. But something remains to be found out. Can we talk about this? I can't leave you anymore, Paige. I've reached my limit. If you don't want to talk to me, maybe it's time to put an end to everything. I've been patient, but you're not letting me know what's going on. I've exhausted all my strength. I have no other options, no more ideas and ways. I need you to come home, Paige. I can't live without you. I love you. Please come home as soon as possible. Not yet. I'm not ready. I need a little more time. A few more months. Paige, in a few months we may be going to the divorce court. I can't do this anymore. It's been three months now. Please, I'm begging you. I need a little more time. Three more months. Please. I'll see you next month if our feelings stay the same. Goodbye, Paige. I ended the conversation before she could say anything in response. At that moment, I didn't want to listen to anything she had to say. Despite my attempts to understand her problems, I was unable to do so without receiving any explanation or indication of what was bothering her. She tried to contact me three times, repeatedly called me for four days in a row. But I ignored her calls whenever I saw her number or work number on the caller ID. I ignored her messages without even listening to them. Although deep down I was afraid, I could feel the anger starting to build up in me. I became more and more disappointed when she abruptly cut me out of her life without any explanation. She refused to communicate with me and just kept quiet. It seemed unreasonable to me that she would insist on parting in this way. If we had problems, as we both knew, we should have sought help from a psychologist. But she decided to follow the mysterious path of self-discovery without attracting me. And here's what Paige thinks. I regretted moving out, and realized that self-pity led me to this. I was on the verge of losing my husband, and realized that moments of clarity are rare for me. The past year has upset me, forcing me to withdraw into myself instead of communicating with Carl. Carl was now angrier than ever and refused to talk to me. Despite my attempts to contact him after our last conversation, he completely shut himself off from me. Looking back, I should have realized that everything was coming to this. Our dates were disappointing. They did not meet my initial expectations, and I began to doubt my decision. Despite the fact that my friends at work urged me not to succumb to the persuasions of Carl, who seemed to be turning into a villain, I felt discord. My heart wanted to give Carl a chance, but my head and friends advised the opposite. This internal conflict was one of the reasons why I decided to move out during the separation. I needed to clear my mind of the problems that were clouding my emotions and thoughts. I spent the first month thinking about my relationship with Carl and how it had reached a turning point. 
He was so focused on his business that he didn't pay enough attention to me. I knew that his hard work would eventually benefit both of us. But I couldn't shake the feeling that we were drifting apart. Our recent date night didn't live up to my expectations, and I felt depressed. I should have anticipated Carl's confusion about why I decided to move, and it only increased the tension between us. I realized that all our conversations were about work issues, since I hadn't been home for a month, and Carl seemed distant. I expected him to make more efforts to make me feel needed by him, but instead it felt like I was living with a stranger. Carl, like his brother, sought to build a successful business that could later be sold and retired. I didn't keep track of Carl's progress and whereabouts, and his mentions that he was close to his goal put a lot of pressure on me. Despite nagging doubts, I selfishly focused on my own desires, neglecting Carl's ambitions. I let my self-doubt drive a wedge between us and behave childishly, trying to push him away. Since the son of the company's owner joined the team, there has been a lot of activity in the workplace. He was rapidly expanding the business, and despite his reputation as a ladies' man, the impressive results overshadowed all possible problems with his behavior. The owner did not notice his son, believing that he could not do anything wrong. He even said that Charles could walk on water. Charles also showed an increased interest in me, and his grumpy appearance could not leave any woman indifferent. Many who fell under his charm could confirm this. At times, I hardly thought about being married, but after moving my libido increased dramatically. Staying alone in my apartment, I gave myself pleasure. At first only Carl was present in my fantasies. Unknowingly, I started thinking about Charles almost every night. This should have caused me anxiety. Carl has always been the object of my fantasies for as long as I can remember. I've never fantasized about celebrities or other famous people. Looking back, we can say that the problems in my marriage with Carl were not as significant as I thought. My friends started noticing problems in our relationship because of the way I talked and behaved at work. Based on their assumptions, they believed that Carl was deliberately ignoring me or couldn't satisfy me. But it was unfair to accuse Carl of something he might not have suspected. I let their opinion make me feel deprived of my spouse's attention. Charles has been trying to win me over ever since he found out that I left Carl. Someone from the office spread false information about why I left Carl, as a result of which I got the impression that I deserved the best, and Carl is not a real man. I was ashamed to admit that I had never fought the rumors that were circulating around Carl and me. Instead, I preferred to brush them off and pretend they didn't bother me. I convinced myself that our relationship was nobody's business, and that their gossip couldn't hurt us. Our personal lives had always been a secret, but now that so much attention was focused on us, the innocent details I shared with Carl were exaggerated without my knowledge. There were various rumors about Carl's inability to satisfy me in bed. Some of them even included specific details. I would never have believed that my friends could be so cruel in their opinion of my husband. It occurred to me that perhaps, in my self-centeredness, I also did not present him in a private or positive light. I didn't know the details of most of the rumors, only that my close friends downplayed their importance to me and spread them behind my back to others. With the exception of a few close friends, no one in the office was interested in Carl and our personal life outside of work. I should have realized the consequences of spreading rumors because they usually come up when you least expect it. If I had known what was going to happen, I would have behaved differently and not taken such drastic actions as abandoning Carl. Unfortunately, my epiphany came too late. Carl, on the contrary, outwardly seemed to be the perfect man, radiating masculinity and charm that would make any woman faint. I was attractive, rich, smart, and had a great sense of humor. I should have been more aware of my own personality and values. I was no longer just a young, carefree woman. Despite this, I let Charles talk me into going on a date with him, even though I knew it was a mistake. I made a promise to my husband Carl that I would never jeopardize our marriage by dating another man. But I agreed to go on a date with Charles anyway. To tell the truth, I was wrong. 
I knew that rejecting Charles could mean the end of my career at the company. Despite that, I should have refused the date. I should have focused on seeing in Carl the man I really needed, and I certainly shouldn't have dreamed of anyone but him. But I fooled myself into believing that Charles would behave like a gentleman, and that this date was a purely professional event, not a romantic outing. This was just the beginning of a series of erroneous decisions. On Thursday evening, I received an invitation to Dave and Brenda again. When I came to them, I was surprised to find a stranger in their house. The man, whose name was Jim Stedman, chatted with Dave while Brenda was cooking dinner. Hi Carl, it's Jim. He's a private investigator that I hired, Dave explained. I was taken aback and asked, What do you need a private investigator for, Dave? His answer was unexpected. For you, I've assigned him to look after Paige. I couldn't resist cursing under my breath. What are you going to tell me? Do I want to know? I asked. Dave hesitated before answering. I'm not sure, Carl. Jim has been following your wife for a little over a month now. Can you tell that during this time she was mostly alone? She spent most of her time alone, with only work and occasional visitors to keep her company. They were mostly work colleagues who dropped by to chat on the porch before leaving. One guy who invited her to lunch last Monday seemed to me like a wolf, the kind that preys on vulnerable women and uses their problems against them. This was definitely to be feared. He towers above everyone, a predator in the business world, with a wolfish demeanor, capable of breaking anyone until they collapse. He is young, rich, and exudes power thanks to his tall stature and black hair, which are combined with his BMW and designer suits. I mistakenly hoped that he had blonde hair, praying that he would not turn out to be the son of the owner of the company where she works. But my fears were confirmed, he turned out to be the one I was afraid of all this time. Now I felt even more anxious. If he seduces Paige, our marriage could be in jeopardy. I wasn't sure how far I was willing to go in this situation. Am I willing to risk our future for the next few months? Or even for the rest of my life if he succeeds? I was trying to come up with a plan of action. Should I step in and confront him, hoping that Paige will figure out what's going on and come back to me? Or stay away and hope that Paige can resist his advances? I was confused and didn't know what to do next. May I give you my thoughts, sir? Jim asked. Yes, please start, I replied. It seems to me that your wife is trying to sort out her life. If you intervene now, you risk alienating her forever. I have already encountered similar situations and usually advise you to intervene. But in this case, I believe that your wife will figure it out on her own. What really bothers you is that man is a predator, right? The implication is that if you banish it, then in the future you will have to constantly deal with other threats. You will forever doubt your wife's loyalty. If you don't step in and he wins, you could lose everything. Judging by what your brother has shared with me, it seems that you have a difficult relationship with your wife. If you tell her about her behavior, you risk alienating her from you. But if you don't solve the problem, things can only get worse. Apparently, Paige is good at heart. So perhaps the best approach would be to give her the opportunity to make the right choice. If this does not work, and there is still time to save the situation, act without hesitation. People can make mistakes, and it's possible that Paige's behavior is not in her spirit. It's worth considering that Paige has always had a high libido, perhaps even more than you do. I'm worried that she might make a mistake, and I believe that she is capable of thinking rationally. I have a feeling that in the end she will justify herself. Let's give her a chance. She's been acting like one of the best lately. I would give her some leeway to get better. Not so that she would make a mistake, but in order to get out of the situation she is in now. With these words, he gave his report with the photos and left us. I owed my brother a lot. The idea of hiring someone to look after her had never crossed my mind before. It never seemed necessary to me. But now this guy was telling me that I should give her the time she needed. It bothered me, but I decided to leave it for later. It's not going to be that easy, that's for sure.
We set the next date for Saturday again. When I called her that morning to confirm the appointment, I was stunned. Hi Paige, are you ready for our date tonight? I asked. Will it be like last time, Carl? She replied. We didn't have a last time, Paige. I'm sorry, but I have some things to do, so can we reschedule our date for tomorrow? Are you okay? Paige, do you think we're going to be okay? I believe that everything will be fine, Carl. I need a little more time, but I've already made my decision. Thank you for putting up with me. I love you. I know it wasn't easy for you. I just want you to be at home with me, Paige. See you tomorrow? Yes, around this time. After that phone call, I felt a sense of relief that I hadn't felt in a long time. Paige seemed to have gained clarity, and the detective's advice to give her freedom was justified. After taking a shower, I decided to go out for dinner. I'm tired of the usual canned bean food and dinners on TV. I called my brother and asked him and Brenda to join me. He was glad to hear my positive attitude and offered to treat me to dinner. I agreed to meet them at their chosen place, which seemed to me more elite than the one I was used to. Despite the fact that I had to dress up a bit, including putting on a tie, I didn't mind, given the positive mood I was in. When I arrived at the place, I found Dave and Brenda already sitting at a table. The waiter escorted me to their table, and I joined them. Over dinner, I shared the exciting news that Paige and I had a date the next day. She seemed ready to resume our relationship, as she spoke cheerfully and positively. I hope this ordeal ends soon and we can move on. So Paige shouldn't be here, Carl? Brenda looked at me strangely, and Dave looked worried. Curious, I turned to see what was causing their behavior, and saw my wife approaching them with someone at the head. That's when I noticed that Paige had brought someone with her. The same jerk that the private investigator told me about was next to her and casually touched her as they walked around the hall. It was clear that he thought he could control her. I felt anger rising in me, ready to rush at him. But Dave stopped me, telling me to stay where I was. Leave it alone, Carl. Paige has to make her own choice, he reminded me. You can't force her. Did you see that, Dave? He touched her in an inappropriate way. I swear I wanted to contradict him, but Dave advised me to calm down and let Paige make her own decision about who she wants to be with. I sat there and freaked out. My good mood has completely evaporated. I could clearly see them, this couple, sitting at the table across from me. He reached out to take her hand, but she quickly pulled away and picked up the menu. He leaned back in his chair, continuing to talk to her. I strained to hear them talking, but they were too far away. All I could do was sit and watch my wife go on a date with another man. Dave and Brenda tried to engage me in conversation, but I was a terrible guest. Despite all my efforts, I couldn't bring myself to enter into a dialogue with them. It was hard to ignore Paige and this guy, who were sitting in a way that was hard to miss. I couldn't help but watch as he cunningly put his hand under the table. Paige surreptitiously adjusted something on her leg and then put her hand back in place. When the waiter came over, they placed their orders. As soon as the waiter left, Paige imperceptibly made a disapproving gesture to her companion under the table. He seemed to be trying to do something inappropriate, perhaps trying to get under her dress. Paige was visibly uncomfortable in his presence. Fortunately, they were unaware of my presence. I don't think she expected to see me there at all. Despite my anger, I silently hoped that Paige would make the right choice and be a good wife. Dave and Brenda exchanged anxious glances, clearly worried about what would happen next. After finishing my meal, I insisted on ordering dessert to buy some time. I needed to keep a close eye on my wife's actions. Despite Dave and Brenda's attempts to dissuade me, I was determined. In the end, they gave up and ordered dessert too. While we were waiting for treats, the jerk at the table became too friendly to Paige. At least I was making an effort. But it was becoming increasingly obvious to me that Paige felt uncomfortable in his presence. It became clear to me that she regretted agreeing to come here with him. He was too outspoken, and it was difficult for her to maintain her composure while fighting off his advances. Unable to watch what was happening anymore, I felt that I had to intervene. 
even if it would entail consequences. I got up and hurried to their table, walking briskly rather than running. I quickly approached her, covering the distance in the blink of an eye. His hand was already between her legs. When I came up, he looked at me, not seeming to understand who I was. Paige fought against his onslaught, her voice begging him to stop. She's with me, I said firmly. This is my wife that you're trying to seduce. Stop it. Paige's face paled when I said those words, and she, realizing my presence, continued to fight him off. She tried not to look me in the eye, but to focus on something under the table. Carl, it's not what you think, she began to explain. Her interlocutor turned to me with a hostile look. Shut up, Paige. I'll deal with this fool myself, I snapped. As the conversation progressed, I became more and more rude and overconfident. I'm her husband, you idiot. Keep your hands off her, I said. The man stood up. His tone became aggressive. Are you her husband? A man who can't satisfy her in bed? A weakling who can't stand up for himself? The guy who couldn't protect her and let her slip away? She's free now? I can't say exactly when it all started. All I remember is the force of my fist hitting his skull. His head fell back and he looked stunned as I stood over him. Paige was in tears and there was fear in her eyes. Dave tried to hold me back and take me away but I waved him away. Grabbing my lover by his tie, I brought down a barrage of blows on his face. Before I knew it the police arrived and handcuffed me. Paige disappeared and the lover shouted that he was going to press charges. I was taken to jail and my brother said he would find me a lawyer. As a result, I spent the whole night in a cell in the company of drunks. That was the end of the day. The only thing I missed was a buddy who sat with me and told me how damn good we had a good time. The next morning when I was charged, my lawyer released me on bail. I had serious problems. The lover shouted that he wanted me to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I had to hold back my laughter when I saw his stitched face and bruises from my fists. It gave me a little sense of satisfaction. When I left the courthouse, Dave and Brenda were waiting for me. Now I was in their custody before the trial and I was in serious trouble. The lawyer discussed the possible consequences of my actions and defense strategies, but I hardly paid attention to it. All I wanted to do was drown my sorrows in alcohol. And then I realized what the lawyer was talking about. What did you say about Paige? The lawyer explained that if we can get Paige to testify that he bullied her, then we can clear my name. After all, I was trying to protect my wife. I felt a wave of panic wash over me. Paige had disappeared the night before, and I was sure she had already filed for divorce. While thinking about it, I heard footsteps approaching. No, Carl, I won't, I heard Paige say. I turned around and saw that she was coming towards me. She looked worried, but the fact that she was talking to me gave me a glimmer of hope. Confused, I asked, What are you doing here, Paige? I came to get you out of jail on bail, but it looks like I came too late. Your brother knew more about it than I did. I'm sorry, Carl. It's all my fault. No, it's not your fault, Paige. He had no right to touch you in a public place. Are you going to leave me, Carl? Only if that's what you want, Paige. Why did you protect me? Because that's what good husbands do, Paige. They love and protect their wives. But I've met him. We had a contract and I broke it. Did you sleep with him, Paige? No, more than that. I even regretted that I agreed to go on a date with him. I forgot that we had a date night planned when he asked me out, and I tried to cancel the meeting but he wouldn't let me. I was afraid that he would create even more problems than he had already created, so I canceled our date to let him know that I was not interested. Everything got out of control, but we only agreed not to sleep with someone, not to date. I forgive you for that. I was hoping today would be a special day, Carl. I was planning to admit that I had settled everything and wanted to go home. To you. Forever. You were right. Yes. I made a stupid decision and should have come to you for advice. I listened to the advice of the wrong people. Although their intentions were good, they were mistaken about my problems. I trusted a man I barely knew, not my beloved husband. I deeply regret all this. 
Are you sure you want to be associated with a criminal? Oh, well, yes. You were great. The way you stood up to him. Everything was amazing. Why did you disappear if everything was so wonderful? I was afraid that you would leave me as soon as you found out about him. I crossed the line with him. But you said you didn't sleep together, didn't you? No, we didn't sleep. But I agreed to go on a date with him when I was already dating you. There is no excuse for this. I want your back, Paige. Let's go to a psychologist and figure out how to fix our relationship. Unless I end up in jail. But I don't think it will be a problem. I plan to sue him for attempted sexual harassment and any other charges I can bring. She offered to help me, and now my lawyer was in control of the situation. She was determined to fix the situation by paying everyone who needed it. Dave and Brenda stood next to me while we discussed the details. He offered to drop the charges against me if she dropped hers related to the incident at the restaurant. But she decided to drop the charges against him. He forced her to go on a date and threatened her with a job if she didn't comply with his demands. His father would end up getting hurt because his son, who was a modern-day Romeo, would work for him. It became tense at home for a while. Thanks to the psychologist, I discovered some of my shortcomings, for example, that I devoted too much time to business and not enough to my relationship with my wife. After some changes, including selling my business for a generous sum, I, like my brother, became a semi-pensioner. Since then, my relationship with my wife Paige has improved, and our intimate life has returned to its former splendor. Thanks to this experience, we have gained valuable knowledge. He showed us that the advice of friends is not always correct. He also taught us how important it is to stand up for what we believe in, even if the outcome is unclear. And sometimes, leaving everything as it is, you can eventually achieve a positive decision. I hope that such thoughts as temporary rape will no longer come to Paige's mind. The first time I met Sam was when she was released for causing a computer network outage by uploading a seemingly innocent cat video. She didn't know that this cute kitten was actually a lioness in disguise with malware. Seeing that she needed support, I offered to help carry her personal belongings while she was being escorted out by security. I admit that at first I had ulterior motives to make friends with her. I hoped to get closer to her. But I quickly discovered that she has a habit of not wearing underwear under short skirts. Six months later, I was fascinated by her childlike innocence and insatiable desire for intimacy. I couldn't resist asking her to move in with me, and just six months later, we exchanged vows. The night before the wedding, I hugged her to me and promised to be her protector, ready to overcome any obstacles for the sake of her happiness. I swore eternal love and fidelity, but on one indispensable condition, absolute devotion. I made it clear that any hint of infidelity would mean the end of our marriage, no second chances. I will destroy you and everyone who touches you, I threatened Sam. I love you and would never do that, she quickly added. The first two years of our marriage were amazing, the envy of all our friends. I was a caring husband, showered her with gifts, and took her to fancy dinners in Chicago every night. I liked to dress her in designer clothes and expensive jewelry, showing them off to everyone. One day she declared her boredom and desire to find a job. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't stop her determination. I even offered her to finance her own luxury boutique business, but she insisted on doing it on her own. It was only later that I found out that my wife's decision was influenced by two divorced friends from a fitness club. These offended women, who had given up their husbands to younger partners, enjoyed the destruction of happy marriages. Week after week, her friends instilled in Sam that her partner did not appreciate her and that the key to independence was to find a job and earn money on her own. With these thoughts in mind, Sam went to the labor market in search of a job that could satisfy her. Despite her outward beauty and expensive outfits, Sam had difficulty in interviews when asked about office skills. After three months of countless interviews, she was left disappointed, as no employer wanted to contact her. One day my wife came home beaming with delight. 
she just got a job as a personal assistant. Curious, I asked her some basic questions about her new role, such as who hired her and what tasks she would be responsible for. Although she couldn't remember the name of the company, she was sure she could find it easily. The only detail she remembered was that the position involved business trips. With whom? I asked. Rummaging through her expensive Gucci bag, she found a business card. I will be working for Andrew W. Carter & Partners, she announced. The business card was simple and uncomplicated. A white rectangle with a black inscription, Andrew W. Carter President CEO, and a phone number. I couldn't help but think how cheap it looks. What exactly did Andrew V. Carter & Partners specialize in? Import or export of goods? I hugged my wife, looking her straight in the eyes. Sam, I have a bad feeling about this. Let me investigate. This was the reason for our first tense argument. She accused me of not wishing her success but of wanting her to be just an accomplice. In fact, that was all she was capable of. Sam was stubborn like no one else and refused to listen to reason. With a determined expression on her face, she made it clear that she would rather agree to a quarrel than admit her guilt. Unbeknownst to everyone, I have instructed my investigators to conduct a thorough investigation of Carter's company. On Sunday evening, I received an email with a detailed report. It turned out that Carter was a small importer of counterfeit goods, which they sold to discount stores. A significant part of their business came from the regional trade shows where Sam worked. The current sales department consisted of men over the age of 50. Sales declined as Chinese manufacturers began to sell goods directly, cutting off intermediaries such as Carter. As a major trade show in New York approached, Carter gathered his sales team to discuss strategy. The success of the company depended on this exhibition. One of the suggestions was to boost sales by inviting an attractive woman in a very revealing outfit to the stand. Sam had a whole collection of matching outfits. It was clear that Carter didn't need a personal assistant, but a way to get attention. Sunday 3 passed without incident, but Monday morning brought unexpected changes. Sam was immaculately dressed, and I couldn't help but compliment her. After offering her a ride to work, I was shocked when she agreed. Wanting to make a good impression, I gave her a luxurious Italian leather briefcase. Sam graciously accepted the gift, promising that I would be proud of her. When we arrived at Carter's office building, it became clear that it was going through hard times. The three-story building was in disrepair, with faded paint and a weathered sign indicating its age. Sam looked worried as she looked at the dilapidated building. After a few minutes, she turned to me and gave me a surprised kiss on the lips, which she hadn't done since Friday. I think that's it, she said. I think so. I'll pick you up at five, I replied. She kissed me again and whispered, I love you. I love you too, I replied. The rest of the day seemed to drag on endlessly as I waited impatiently at the end of the block for the clock to strike five. When it finally happened, I stopped in front of the main entrance. A group of men in ill-fitting suits came out of the building. Probably the sellers, I thought to myself. After a while, a group of elderly women dressed in clothes suitable for the warehouse came out. After waiting for about ten minutes, I finally entered the hall, where Sam's laughter was coming from. Noticing the bell of the administrator on the table, I eagerly rang it. In response, my wife's voice rang out, promising that she would be out soon. As soon as I met her new boss, I immediately realized that he was a ladies' man. He didn't even bother to shake my hand, but just smiled smugly. As soon as we left, I warned my wife. He looked at you like a lion at a gazelle. She dismissed my concerns, saying that he was just an experienced salesman. I laughed at her naivety knowing the truth about the man who sold cheap fakes produced by exploited workers. He served the lowest strata of society, as well as his low-quality goods. It wasn't until we arrived at our favorite restaurant that Sam started talking again. And on Tuesday morning, she dressed up again as if she was going to a glamorous event. When I asked how she was dressed for a dilapidated office, she confidently stated that she knew the way to work and would drive herself. 
Without answering my question or kissing me goodbye, she left. In the evening, she returned home, excited after a day spent exploring their assortment, and carried a bag full of different goods. I tried to show interest while she talked in detail about each product. In the second week, however, three unpleasant events occurred. Sam continued to dress up excessively and began to go to lunch with Carter to discuss the product line. She started working late with him to prepare for an exhibition in New York. The turning point came when she started ignoring my calls because of their busy work schedule. Everything fell into place on Thursday, when Sam returned home a little before 10. I gave her an ultimatum, either quit your job or face the consequences. I tried to assure her that this was only a temporary period of study and that everything would calm down after the exhibition. I begged her to quit her job and even offered to help her open her own business, like a store in a mall. But she still hesitated. She insisted on proving her independence. Last Friday, Sam ignored 10 phone calls and returned home just after 11 p.m. I was waiting for her at the door. Is your phone not working? I asked. Sam's behavior instantly turned hostile, and she accused me of not trusting her. I will never interfere with your success if you have excellent career opportunities, I assured her. Sam rejected the idea, pointing out that she earns only the minimum wage. The value of the jewelry you wear exceeds his entire business, I said angrily. Why don't you trust me? What's the matter? What is it? She asked. I trust you. It's Carter who doesn't inspire confidence in me, I replied. I've met too many predators like him. Besides, what makes you suitable for this job besides your beauty? Why are you dressed like a model to check out cheap plastic goods in a dirty warehouse? The situation has really worsened. We have a three-day trade convention in New York next week, and I'm going there, regardless of your opinion. You better get used to it. And then get used to living alone, because if everything goes the way I'm afraid, I won't be here when you get back. Our marriage is going to end. I can't believe you said that. It is important for us to discuss how we will distribute my income. We could save them for a trip to Europe, Hawaii, or any other place of your choice. But considering that you earn $13 an hour without deductions, we may not have that luxury. Sam got upset and left the room, went to the bathroom and didn't talk to me all weekend. On Monday, a limo came to pick her up. I kissed her one last time and said, You've made a decision. I hope you can come to terms with it. She was silent. After some effort, I managed to hire a private investigator to sit across from her and Carter during their flight east. Carter, being economical, chose a cheap flight. The detective promised to keep audio and video recordings of their entire journey. Instead of getting a call from Sam and informing me of my safe arrival, I was informed by a detective. They behaved like mischievous teenagers, with Carter repeatedly touching her thigh despite her initial protests. I was on the verge of smashing my phone out of frustration. He informed me that he would transfer the surveillance duties to someone else in order to avoid exposure. Despite wanting to call Sam and tell her that I was aware of their activities, I resisted, knowing that it had not been successful in the past. Instead, I focused on developing the second phase of my plan. Later in the evening, my private investigator sent me detailed information. They spent most of the day doing business-related things, but at 6 o'clock they returned to their rooms to change for dinner, and I was surprised to see Sam in a little black dress that I didn't recognize. The detective gave strict orders not to interfere unless it seemed that Carter was forcing Sam. Their task was simply to observe and document. It hurt, but Sam had to make the decision about our marriage on her own. And yet I couldn't resist the last attempt. As I watched them enter the restaurant together, I called Sam, but received a voicemail message. Then I contacted the restaurant and asked for Mrs. Samantha Weatherstone. She was clearly unhappy that I was following her actions. After a long day at work, I had dinner at a diner. It upsets me that you don't answer my calls and messages, and I have no choice but to look for you. Samantha, I love you immensely, so I want to give our marriage one last chance. I know you're not really at the diner, 
and this is the first time you've lied to me. I'm willing to forgive you if you tell Carter you're quitting. A first-class ticket will be waiting for you at the airport. Please, if you really love me and our marriage, make the right choice. The call ended abruptly. My wife hung up, and I felt abandoned. My private investigator sent me a video of Sam talking to Carter, who seemed to have overheard our conversation and was sure that she would stay working for him. He treated her as if she belonged to him, touched her inappropriately while offering drinks. An hour later, I received another video showing them entering Carter's room. I couldn't bring myself to look at the recordings from the hidden cameras they had installed. After drinking a little to numb the pain, I saw Carter insulting me for not supporting Sam's ambitions. He accused me of being jealous of her success. Stay with me and I will help you become the best employee in the industry. My naive wife bought into his lying words, and in the end, it led to the breakup of our marriage. Without hesitation, I immediately contacted my friends at the convention center in New York. Carter confirmed that his truck had been delivered that morning and was ready to unload. Inside there was a stand, the most grandiose and extravagant at the exhibition, as well as thousands of catalogs and tens of thousands of free samples. The company's booth was twice as large as that of its largest competitor, and demonstrated the most advanced video and lighting effects. Shortly after, Carter's 40-foot intermodal container disappeared from the loading dock, and a week later it stood empty at a truck stop in New Jersey. I spent the night in a chair, anxiously waiting for Sam to change his mind. The next morning, my private investigator confirmed that they spent the night together in his room and made love. He treated your wife disrespectfully, as if she were nothing more than a thing. As soon as they entered the room, he forcibly took off her dress and pushed her onto the bed, after which he continued his actions without protection. After a few seconds, he completed his actions and casually announced his intention to sleep, leaving your wife in tears. Despite my attempts to remain calm, the sound of her crying throughout the night was heartbreaking. The private investigator noted that she did not seem to have rested at all. Overcoming my anger, I made two more phone calls, this time local. The next day, I asked the concierge to deliver a note to Carter's door for my wife. I've been trying to call your room all night, but I haven't received an answer. I guess that means we've said goodbye forever. A private investigator informed me that you were screaming and crying uncontrollably, admitting your mistake and warning Carter to stay away. Get dressed quickly! You need to work! He angrily threw the dress in her direction. Sam begged him to provide her with a return ticket. Grinning, he insulted her by calling her a derogatory name. If you want to go home, be ready to entertain my clients, he threatened. Sam raised her voice, accusing him of getting her drunk and taking advantage of her. He denied his guilt, warning that the police would not believe her because of her appearance. Their argument was interrupted by a knock on the door of one of the cellars. In a panic, Sam grabbed her dress and hurried to the bathroom. Carter stood in the doorway, completely naked, clutching Sam's lace bra in his hand. He was determined to show that he had emerged victorious. Boss, we have a serious problem, he exclaimed as he entered the room. I was in the conference room, but our room is completely empty. There is nothing there. No stand, no boxes, no samples. I talked to someone at the dock and they confirmed that the truck never arrived. Carter's face lost color as he tried to process the news. Damn, was all he could say. It took Sam a while to collect her thoughts before she could call for help. She made a conscious decision to act like an ignoramus, and that was her skill. I decided not to answer the call, leaving it on my voicemail. Although I knew it wouldn't change anything, I needed to hear if Sam would admit he was wrong. Unfortunately, I listened as she did nothing but lie. I'm sorry I took a sleeping pill and missed your call, she said. She had the courage to say, I love you. Please call me back when you hear this message, she begged, inundating me with calls every 10 minutes. I chose to ignore them all and instead contacted my lawyer to start the divorce process. Carter was in a panic. The exhibition was supposed to open in just 30 minutes, 
and he didn't have any ready-made materials. Desperate, he started making urgent phone calls, but even the police couldn't help. Surveillance footage showed that the night before, a white truck without license plates and any identification marks left with the goods. Promising that a detective would arrive soon to investigate, the authorities did not reassure him. As a last attempt, Carter instructed the warehouse to collect all available catalogs and brochures and send them on the next flight to New York. The evening was disappointing. Carter spent the day sitting on a borrowed bar stool and showing off a homemade sign he made at a convenience store. His team was struggling to promote non-existent goods, and Sam was crying quietly in the corner, looking exhausted. Andrew Carter and his colleagues became the subject of ridicule in the crowd, while their Chinese competitors, who were located nearby, kindly handed out gifts with a smile and a bow. On the second day of the exhibition, a pallet with boxes arrived late. Unfortunately, the boxes turned out to contain outdated catalogs and last year's products, which are no longer in demand. Despite the fact that several people came to talk to Carter, no one wanted to place an order at the company, which, according to rumors, will soon cease its activities. As a result, his competitors took all the orders, and by the end of the day, Carter felt overwhelmed. In the end, he gave in to Sam's request to go home and screamed in frustration. When we got back to Chicago, Carter said bluntly, I never want to see you again. He quickly assembled his sales team, encouraging them to move forward, and then quickly left the company. Instructing one of them to exchange tickets for an earlier flight home, Carter made sure that they left as soon as possible. Sam, unhappy with the late departure at 10 a.m. the next day, spent the night alone in her room. She dutifully sent me her flight details, noting that Flight 901 would land at O'Hare Field the next day at noon. Despite the fact that they were sitting next to each other, none of them said a word. Carter was busy arranging a credit line after losing the collateral. Sam sat in silence, hoping to keep her marriage going throughout the flight. Working for a venture capitalist had its advantages. Carter had connections that allowed him to speed up the process without having to deal with paperwork. These connections worked in the shadows and provided Carter with significant privileges. The series of phone calls I made earlier set everything in motion. I knew she would board the plane at 9 a.m. local time. As soon as the plane took off and she was out of reach, I immediately turned off both of her mobile phones. After that, I canceled all our credit cards and by noon transferred all our funds to a separate account so that they could not be traced. Despite the fact that someone might object that she was entitled to half, I didn't care at all. After knocking on my door, a team of movers arrived to pack my things for storage. I took all the jewelry that I didn't have time to take to New York. Shortly after the movers left, a bulldozer and a small crane were unloaded into my driveway without any questions. They immediately began demolishing my $500,000 house, leaving behind only a neat pile of rubble. After finishing their work, they disappeared into the fog like the mythical city of Brigadoon. My detective was sitting in the row behind Sam on the plane, and they didn't say a word the whole flight. Upon landing, she immediately tried to turn on her mobile phone, but found that its service had been cancelled. In a panic, she rushed down the ramp in search of a payphone. When she approached a man in a black suit holding a sign with her name on it, she assumed it was the limo driver who was supposed to take her home. Desperate to make a call, she asked if she could borrow his phone. Are you Mrs. Samantha Weatherstone? What's the matter? What is it? She asked. When she confirmed her identity, he handed her a large manila envelope. You have been served, he said coldly. And no, you can't take my phone. Sam began to panic. I don't see our driver, Carter said, approaching her. Sam quickly pushed him away, warning, Get away from me or I'll scream! She found a phone booth and tried to call her cell phone, but received a message that the number was disconnected. Then she called the office number, which, as I told her, is intended only for emergencies, and she was informed that no one by her name works there. Sam didn't know that I had already left for a new job in the Los Angeles office. 
Samantha opened the envelope and flipped through the divorce application. Overwhelmed with emotion, she fell to her knees and burst into uncontrollable sobs. Compromising photos of her with her boss fell out of the envelope. Unaware of this, Carter's wife received an identical set of incriminating photos at the same time. Meanwhile, at the airport, the security service received a signal about a woman in trouble. A medical team quickly arrived to help, one of whose employees grabbed her bags while paramedics assessed the situation. A vigilant guard noticed a divorce certificate among her belongings and calmly informed her about it. In desperation, she begged them to help her find a taxi. I need to get home before it's too late, she pleaded. Despite the fact that they could not get behind the wheel, they agreed to help and called a taxi. Urging the driver to hurry up, she directed him to her house. But when they turned the corner, she was shocked to see that she was no longer at home. Sam, confused, let out a piercing scream, realizing the reality of what was happening. The driver, wanting to get out of the situation as soon as possible, demanded to pay $45 for the fare. As she held out her credit card, she felt numb. The man tried to run his finger over it, but it didn't work. In desperation, she tried all the cards she had, but they were all reset. If you don't have the money, I'll call the police, he threatened. Sam frantically rummaged in her pockets and finally managed to find the money for the trip. Hastily putting her bags on the sidewalk, the driver sped off, and Samantha fell to the ground, trying to catch her breath. Everything she worked for was lost. Her dreams shattered. Carter's day ended as badly as it began. Two of my colleagues followed him to his house on the north coast. They were driving in a borrowed pickup truck and waiting for the driver to quickly stop by the store for cigarettes. Watching from afar, they saw Carter get out of the limo and walk towards the front door with a defeated pose. No sooner had he reached the entrance than his wife ran out into the street, shouting, Get out, you worthless, treacherous bastard! She angrily waved photos of him and Sam in front of his face. Carter stood speechless while his wife hurled a barrage of verbal attacks at him. Some neighbors came out of their houses to find out what was going on. Carter's BMW was parked at the entrance, and he managed to slip inside while his furious wife pounded on the windshield. I'm going to divorce you, traitor, she screamed, grabbing his suitcase and throwing it at the glass, causing it to shatter. Ignoring her, Carter drove across the lawn to escape, unaware that he was being followed. Eventually, he stopped at the bar and ordered a double whiskey, which was quickly followed by another. After an hour and three strong drinks, Carter felt rested as he drove to his warehouse. But that same night, the offices and warehouse owned by Andrew Carter and his associates were engulfed in flames. The fire became the main news topic for two days, and fire trucks from seven different departments of the suburb worked together to fight the spectacular blaze. Flames could be seen rising to the sky, as if clearing the earth of Andrew Carter's presence. The fire continued to smolder the next day, and firefighters had to start extinguishing the remaining fires. It took arson investigators two days to find Carter's charred remains in a huge bonfire ignited by paper and plastic. Dental scans were used for identification. When his wife found out about his infidelity, she kicked him out of the house, which further aggravated his suffering. In a drunken state, he turned off the sprinkler system and set fire to his warehouse. The insurance company sent a team of arson investigators to sift through the remains of the sprawling building. At the same time, a forensic accounting examination confirmed that Carter's loan would have been terminated and continued to investigate the fire as a possible arson for monetary gain. As a result, they rejected his widow's insurance claim. Due to the carelessness of one man, his wife and children were left homeless. Twenty people were left without work and I lost the love of my life.